How's it going guys? A lot in store for the day. I'm getting the Mercedes back and I'm taking the Lambo to VF to check out if there's anything wrong with it. Before we roll out, I've got to give a huge shout out to LastPass who I've partnered with to make this video possible. Now look, I've got a lot of passwords. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, banking, Club Penguin. Wait, what? I make all my passwords different for safety reasons, but honestly, that makes it really hard to remember everything. I'm sure most of you have a ton of passwords, most of which you can't remember. The amount of time I've wasted trying to type in passwords over and over again, then being locked out of the account, then forgetting my security question, and then thinking I'm trying to hack when all I want to do is just log in, is pretty embarrassing. However, LastPass relieves the trouble of finding passwords and removes all anxiety about getting locked out of your account. You no longer have to remember it. You don't have to write it down. You don't have to put it in an envelope and stick it in the freezer. Actually, I don't know why you would do that. Oh, thank God. Oh, I'm this is warmer. That was so dumb. But LastPass makes it all super simple. Now, if you're worried about security, it's on Apple's website. Millions of people use it, including myself. Anyways, put your passwords on autopilot with LastPass. Click the link in the description below. You can sign up for free. It's worth it. On to the video. So I'm riding in the new S4, and it has Apple CarPlay, which basically looks like a simplified version of your iPhone screen. Really nice. So I was wondering, what cars come with Apple CarPlay? So it looks like a lot of the new Audi models, but the best thing is they have the Centenario on the list. <laughs> it's the only Lamborghini that has Apple CarPlay, but that's awesome. I feel like this would make the Stradman extremely happy. Wow, a lot of Ferrari models have Apple CarPlay. Interesting. Oh boy. Holy crap. Dude, this actually looks like a mirror. Can you tell me a little bit about the Opticoat Pro? Yeah, so uh, what we did first is we did the paint correction. Uh, obviously a lot of people know what the paint correction is. So we leveled down the paint, so we take down, take down some of the scratches, the micro marn and stuff like that. And then we top it off with Opticoat Pro Plus. Gotcha. So it's a two layer system. So what we'll do is uh, we lay down the Opticoat Pro. About 30 minutes later, we lay down the Pro Plus. And what that is, it's a, it's a ceramic coating that's uh, chemically resistant. So any bird drop etchings, anything, they won't etch into the paint. They'll actually stick onto the ceramic coating and the ceramic coating will, will shed that uh, etching. That's sweet. And yeah. it's on the wheels too, so brake dust won't collect as easily? Yeah, so brake dust is not gonna stick as easily. Um, you're gonna notice when you drive in the rain, every, all the water's gonna flow like crazy over the hood. It's gonna rain tomorrow. What the hell is with that? Yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> except I don't have a second windshield wiper. Look at this. Yeah. yeah you... <laughs> it flew off. <laughs> well, the car is clean as hell. Steamy's absolutely killed it. It looks like a mirror, and I, I almost don't wanna drive it because it's never gonna look that clean ever again. But now, I am gonna go for a ride in a plane. On today's episode of Airplane Virgins, we go in not the Ferrari 360, but the Lance Air 360. This is much faster than a Ferrari 360, and I don't think you could go upside down in the air in a 360 and survive. You could probably do it off a cliff, though. This is just a good-looking airplane. It's like the aerial atom of airplanes. Do you bring your shoes with you, or do you just leave them? Oh, I bring them. Okay. Cool. All right, sorry mom and dad. All right, clear. <laughs> this is so damn cool. <laughs> How fast does the plane accelerate compared to a car? Pretty quick. Uh, I'll let you be the judge of that, but it's pretty good. <laughs> okay, cool. About to take off in the smallest airplane I've ever been in in my entire life. Probably the fastest. When you hold me, nothing seems to move 
fantastic experience flying over all the places I've been to before, but on the ground in a car at 250 miles an hour in an airplane. Maybe I should get an airplane. Just kidding. Take it easy. Beautiful Jag and beautiful plane. Oh, that guy is a champion. This car is seriously cleaner than it was brand new. When I got this delivered, it was actually in the middle of a winter storm in the middle of Detroit. They drove it out to me, so I don't think I've ever seen it this clean. Oh my God, the Scion back there has the extreme performance vents from AutoZone. Wow, it must have a V10 in it, honestly. Here it comes. Look at those vents in the front. Damn, come back. All right, M3, time to move. If you are new to Vehicle Virgins, I'm actually giving this car away. More details in the description, but it's a pretty clean M3. Now it's time to take my Lamborghini to VF, not this one, although I guess I could bring it, and check out the reason behind the check engine light. And I think the CEO of the company is there right now, and he wants to show me some of the more technical aspects of the kit. As a mechanical engineer myself, I graduated from University of Michigan. I'm pretty stoked on that. I'd love to learn more about how the kit works that's in my car. I love the cold startup on this bad boy. Nice Continental GT. You know, I've never been a big fan of the Continental GT. It just seems too much like an old man grandpa car. I don't find anything special about it. I will say though, the unveiling of the 2019 Continental GT, that is a car I like. It's official 20,000 miles. What a fantastic journey it's been the last 18,100 miles in this car. I'm in love with the Huracan. Like I always say, if you're looking into a Huracan, just know that it is 100% daily drivable, and in the last 18,000 miles, well, 20,000 total, there have been zero issues. Knock on wood, but yeah. It's just a well-built Volkswagen. Good job. Rolling up the VF. Oh, a stop sign. Is that a launch control spot? Oh, no. UPS, damn it. Here we are. Just showed up to VF. They've got an LP560 here, which is getting a supercharger installed. So if you have an LP560, you don't have to have a Huracan in order to get the supercharger. My buddy Gary had one, and it made it exactly as fast as a normal Gallardo, although he had the ESS kit, and I think this one's a lot better. Damn, VF's couches are very comfortable. That's a perk. Well, we hooked up the scanner. What's the, what are some of the codes that are showing up? Sensor, uh, bank one sensor one heating circuit. Well, gotcha. Open circuit. It's currently showing that the primary oxygen sensor in bank one is having a fault. So we're gonna see if in fact that's totally busted and needs to be replaced. Didn't think there was actually any issues, but we'll see. Oxygen sensor issues are kind of a somewhat common problem, especially when you go with aftermarket exhausts on Lambos, although that's usually the secondary ones, not the primary ones. We'll see. This is an interesting coloration here. All right, so what are we seeing? So what we have is a range of codes related to bank one sensor one um, with the uh, voltage open circuit gotcha. description. Basically it means a primary oxygen sensor in bank one has uh, failed. Lovely, good. <laughs> Where are those located, the primary? Uh, that's on the uh, down pipes or the headers. Gotcha. The three down pipes. That's probably not that fun to get to. No, you have to go under the car. Gotcha. So the uh, bank one is the passenger side on this car. Gotta love when cheap parts fail, but they're difficult to get to. I'll explain to you how this is working. The engine is divided into, is considered to be two engines by the car manufacturer. So there's a bank one and a bank two, and we can communicate with each computer separately, the bank one and the bank two computer. What we see here are the real-time oxygen sensor values in terms of lambda and its current draw uh, for bank two. This is the primary oxygen sensor. You can see it's actually moving, uh, which means that the sensor is active and reporting a value back to yep. the computer. 
Yeah, yeah the other one is stuck at 0.996, exactly. not so moving. Bank one was stuck at 0.96, gotcha. which uh, basically implies what the codes are for. Fair enough. So how serious is the failed oxygen sensor to the drivability of the car? Like, I should drive it home and then not drive it again until I order the parts, or? I would say you could drive the car safely, okay. as long as you don't redline the car and push it to its limit. Gotcha, okay. Does it say when that happened? Yes, it gives Because I've probably pushed it to its limit many times since it's at the fair. <laughs> it does say it would RPM. Okay. It was near the top end. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So the O2 sensors, also known as the oxygen sensors, are mounted before and after the primary cat in the exhaust stream. The primary O2 sensor is mounted as close to the cylinder head as possible and uh, measures the mixture of air and fuel in the exhaust system, uh, which gives the ECU an indication of how to adjust the fuel. If the primary O2 sensor fails or melts for whatever reason, the ECU will automatically protect the engine and add extra fuel. However, it becomes rather inefficient and then if only one O2 sensor fails, then the engine is imbalanced because one side will run efficiently and the other side less. So uh, the oxygen sensors play a primary part in the safety and the efficiency of the engine's operation. Cool. It's a really good thing that the uh, sensor went out on day one of the rally and I drove the crap out of the car, but I guess it's, it's alive, so sorry. <laughs> well, we've got Nick, the owner of VF, about to tell us all about the kit, which is pretty exciting because as an engineer myself, I'm kind of excited to geek out over what makes my car so fast. Hi. <laughs> Hello. So, um, in front of me here are the key components for our V10, uh, Generation 2 V10 supercharger system. Um, the main component from the engine that we replace is the air intake manifold. This is the, uh, what's also known as the plenum. Yep. It's a uh, single piece, and interestingly it's made from plastic. Yeah, I thought it was metal all along, which I guess on my Gallardo it was, but... Yep, the earlier generation Gallardos, the 5.0s, have, yep. have a metal version. And since uh, Volkswagen Audi have been manufacturing this setup, it seems that they've uh, made a rather trick plastic piece. Yeah. So, you know, we just get rid of that. Just take it off and put it away. <laughs> or, or hang it on the wall or whatever you want to do and have fun looking at it. Yep. So when you buy a kit, the first thing you get is our instruction manual. Uh, we try and keep it as simple as possible. It's got some CAD exploded view drawings and uh, basically a step-by-step -step guide. Has anyone installed these themselves? I don't think we've had any Hurricane owners or RA yeah. owners specifically, but we've had um, obviously independent, independent shops, shops yep. and dealerships too. Cool. So once the intake manifold is removed, we place down uh, a, what we call a tray. Um, we have a 3D printing machine here in house and everything's designed in CAD. And then we print pieces and this is just to show you uh, what a pre-production piece looked like in plastic. Uh, cool. However, uh, we have here a finished piece, yep. which is made from 6061, so T6, aircraft grade uh, aluminum. Yep. And uh, it's all CNC machine here locally, uh, in a factory uh, cool. only 10 miles from here. All our materials are 100% made in California. We take <laughs> great pride in that. Yep. So not only is it sourced and made in the US, but here in California, very. Uh, local proximity to us, we keep control of the quality and uh, uh, the actual, all the processes individually. Yep. So the, the second and the major piece is the what we call the lid. Uh, this concept was something we derived back in 2010 when we designed the Audi R8 Gen 1 supercharger for the V10 engine. Cool. Uh, which was also the same engine in the Gallardo. The, all the design principles ported over to the Generation 2 engines, the uh, what are known as the dual injection engines. They run. Uh, an extra rail of injectors here for emissions uh, reasons and plus we get an extra fuel and power bump yep. from that benefit. But uh, no flames. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so the lid uh, was converted from CAD to plastic into what we see here, finished aluminum casting. Yeah, that's Just gorgeous. poured locally here in Orange County. It's actually a grade 356A and then it's heat treated, CNC machined powder coated with an industrial coating, uh, all actually use the same vendors that the supercharger manufacturer uses for manufacturing the actual compressor itself. So what we have here is a finished assembly, and uh, this That's here so awesome. is the uh, TVS 2300 supercharger from Magnuson. Cool. Uh, Magnuson uses the Eaton TVS 2300 rotor pack, which is uh, a pair of rotors that slide in through the back of the housing 
uh, through a simple gear set, there's a, a basic step up drive. The air intake for the supercharger is through the rear, for which we've uh, created this piece here. It's something, again, we designed all of this back in 2010. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. that definitely needs to come off. <laughs> uh, removed before installation. Yeah. And uh, simply for packaging purposes yeah. and protective reasons, the intake system is mounted to the back of the supercharger. The factory throttle bodies are bolted to our inlet plenum. Awesome. And then we have ports for fittings that have not yet been installed. Gotcha. Uh, however, all the, the vacuum fittings and emissions fittings are mounted. We retain all of the factory EVAP and emission systems, so the readiness monitors set naturally, uh, just as if they would without the supercharger. The interesting part of this kit is the water cooling system, uh, which is mounted inside the lid. Uh, and you have the water fittings, the connections for coolant in and coolant out. And as the supercharger is pulling, drawing air into it and compressing it, it introduces heat into the air charge. And to well, basically to remove the heat, we direct the air through a heat exchanger, which yep. has cool liquid running through it. So if I can lift this up here, we see the heat exchanger system, uh, which the supercharger is pushing through, and then the air enters into the engine. The cooler the air, the more power we're promoting. And is that also referred to as a charged air cooler? Or? Exactly. Okay, gotcha. It's a air to water yep. or after cooling system. And then what do we got over here? Well, over here we have some of the ancillary components for the supercharged kit. We're talking about the cooling system here, we have we this is just one, but we have a pair of these mounted in the car, uh, in the hips. Um, the uh, cooling system that cools the after cooler is a self-contained system. It has its own little tank and reservoir filler and an electric pump to circulate it. So these radiators, well, two of these will cool the liquid before it enters the supercharger heat exchanger. Yep. Uh, and then you've got a, a rotating system there to pull heat out of the air. I will say the cooling system definitely works because I drove the crap out of this car when it was 105 degrees and the amount of heat soak was so much less than what I'm used to on a boosted car. Now, to drive the supercharger, we uh, have a crank pulley. We replaced the, crank, the factory crank pulley with our own piece. Uh, which was designed for us by an OEM. Back in 2009, we conducted some extensive testing here on an R8 V10. This is one of the first production cars uh, that was provided to us uh, just before the cars were released. Uh, what we did wow. was we commissioned an OEM crank uh, dampener manufacturer to come and visit us and measure the, the dampening properties of a design that we created uh, and ended up with this piece here. Uh, it is a one-piece fluid-filled harmonic dampener that replaces the factory version. So when we're doing that, there's a, a number of engineering principles that we have to maintain and follow in order to uh, retain the dampening properties of the eccentrically weighted V10 crank. What uh, type of fluid is in there? It's a formula that, um, that the manufacturer have come upon and uh, don't really disclose it. Gotcha. All of the testing involved um, mounting some extensive sensors and uh, collecting the data and measuring it and uh, we use that to compare the factory dampening with our own dampening to ensure that we've uh, kept within certain standards and principles. Excellent. So now that we've got a, a wider a seven rib drive system uh, to replace the factory five rib, we can drive the supercharger with a much sturdier and wider belt. Uh, this is a Deco Gold label, it's a, it's a premium brand, a premium quality belt, uh, which we've seen uh, really never had to be replaced so far. Yeah, we were just actually looking at my belt and it showed virtually zero signs of any wear. There was no dust. My M5 had belt dust all over the place after like 100 miles of use and this is several thousand miles of complete abuse. It's tucked away back there, but definitely sturdy. Well, we have a few more uh, ancillaries here. This is the belt drive system. It routes the serpentine belt from the crank pulley around the obstructions in the engine bay. Um, gotcha. Drives the nose of the supercharger here. Uh, and what we have is the tensioner. It's a spring-loaded tensioner, and that basically pulls out the slack from the belt during yep. deceleration. It's, it's actually mounted without much disassembly at all. The whole installation process is approximately three days, three to three and a half days. Yeah. A couple of other pieces here. We have some laser cut brackets. Um, mounting some of the components, the radiators, the tensioner mounting brackets. This is an interesting piece here. We designed this in CAD 
printed in plastic for test fitment. And then the fabrication process was uh, intricate. So it starts off with a laser cut flange, uh, mandrel bent and pressed together with some uh, tech yeah. welding. Yeah. Wow. Quite a bit of uh, effort's gone into some of the components. Definitely. And, uh, here's the whole kit, basically. That's pretty awesome. How much tension does the tensioner apply? Because I tried to do a pulley swap on my M5, which I successfully did after screaming a whole bunch, and <laughs> it was really difficult to get off. Yeah, well, we actually uh, have made a laser cut tool that comes with the kit. It actually That's awesome. Inside here, and that allows you to lever the actual tensioner itself. And it actually takes, for me, it can take my, all, my, all my body weight on the end of the lever. Oh, wow, okay. So, so, so it's pretty sturdy. Yeah, but you got a tool for it. That's yeah. a plus. Yeah. Gary's checking my brake pad levels. So you can see the backing plate? Yeah. So the backing plate is a dark part. The uh -huh. pad material is the uh, the lighter part in between the backing plate and the Gotcha. Plate. You just want to keep an eye on that. Um, you want to keep it about three to four millimeters away from the packing plate. Okay, but it looks like it's got plenty of... Um, it's not a lot. I would say you've probably used about 70% of the pads. Okay, brutal. Wow. How much are the pads to replace? I have no idea. No idea? Well, this is just a fun day, isn't it? My brakes have ran out and I need a new O2 sensor. All right, well, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Parker. It's a pleasure, as always. Oh, time to drive it slowly. That's really sad. I'll fix you soon. Time to head back home. I love the guys at VF. They told me to drive slow, so I'm gonna be really cautious on the way home. Oh, this is gonna take so long. Is this slow enough, guys? On the plus side, I did get my tires filled up, so here's how to clear the tire indicator on the Huracan. You click the car button here. That brings up this display on the right. Scroll over to servicing and checks. Tire pressure monitor will display the tire pressure. Looks good. Go back. Store tire pressure. Yes. And there goes the light. Because the O2 sensor has completely taken a crap and it's an open circuit now, I do have a hard fault. So they're unable to clear the code. I mean, of course you can clear the code, but it's just really not a good idea. I'm gonna get that fixed. I've got an independent mechanic that I think can do the job. We'll see how much it costs. I'm curious, honestly. Probably a million dollars. <laughs> just kidding, it shouldn't be that much. It is hard to know for sure what caused the O2 sensor failure. Now, VF has done a ton of supercharger kits for Huracons and R8s, and none of their cars have had the O2 sensor failure. It should last about 50,000 miles on a boosted Huracan. It's, it's rated to 100,000 miles for a stock car. Sometimes aftermarket exhausts can do it, although I don't think that's the case here. Really, I don't know. The good news is it's not that expensive of a problem. So I'll get it fixed so I can drive this thing hard again. Ah, more traffic. Helps me drive slow though, that's nice, I guess. Nope, not nice. Oh, the plastic covers on the wheels actually look kind of cool. It's like a 918. Those magnesium wheels. Wow, what an eventful day. I want to thank you guys yet again for hitting 900,000 subscribers. It means so much to me. I am so excited about the rate that Vehicle Virgins is growing. And that's all you guys. I owe you so much. I'm so excited for potentially hitting a million subscribers very, very soon. Gotta get the Lambo fixed. Hopefully gonna do that in the next couple days. I hope you enjoyed this video. Like always, please browse the channel and subscribe. I look forward to seeing you next video.